This is Sarah Milligan with the Oklahoma State University Library. Um, we are at the um, Shilako Annual um, Homecoming Reunion um, in just north of Newkirk, Oklahoma. Um, I'm here talking to Charles Chepko um, about his time in Shilako as well as his military experience. Um, so that's it. So I like to start just um, with a little bit of information about yourself, so where you're from, um, maybe a little bit about your parents, if you have siblings, just some background information. Uh, I was raised in Weewoka, Oklahoma, which is about 70 miles east of Oklahoma City. I mm -hmm. uh, was raised by my grandparents, but in actuality, they were my mom and dad That's since I was raised by them. I went to the first to the eighth grade there in uh, Weewoka, Oklahoma. Then from the ninth grade on, I was, uh, I came to Schwacko, Oklahoma, or Schwacko High School, and from there I spent uh, from 1956 to 1960 until I graduated. While at Schwacko, I was, uh, I took auto mechanics as my trade. Uh, of course, the normal football, uh, wrestling, track that everybody did, and uh, and uh, well, I, one of the surprising accomplishments that happened while I was there was uh, I was uh, the champion golfer for when we finally got our nine hole course done and we had a tournament play. It must have been my senior year and, uh, and I was the champion golfer for, uh, for that year. So that really surprised me when I look back in old uh, uh, newspapers and stuff and somebody mentions, oh, you was a champion golfer there. I said, well, yeah, I guess I was, you know. But, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, I, and then I graduated in 1960 and then from 19, I graduated on the 27th of May, 1960. 28th May, I was sitting in San Diego, California and I was in the Navy. Oh my gosh. Previous, in my senior year at Shawako, I joined the uh, Army National Guard there at Shawako, 179th Infantry. And uh, there in that summer, of, uh, must have been 1959, we went down to Fort Hood, Texas and spent two weeks uh, uh, training down there. And uh, since I was a pretty good sized guy, they said, okay, here's a BAR which is a big machine gun, and mm -hmm. I hauled that around for the two weeks that was, we was down in Fort Hood, Texas. From there, I found out that uh, I didn't think I, Army life would do me very well by lugging that thing around <laughs> and digging the trains and all that stuff, but uh, my heart was always set that I was going to go into the Navy. Uh -huh. And uh, my uncle was in the Navy, but I had another uncle that was in the Eighty second Airborne, and they didn't ever influence me. But I always seen my uh, uncle that came in from the Navy, and he's always dressed pretty in the nice white uniforms that were starch, and they just impressed me so much that uh, that's what I wanted to do. So uh, a few months before I was going to graduate uh, out of Shawako in 1960, uh, the National Guard says. You're getting ready to graduate. We're going to send you to Fort Leonard Road, Missouri for six months training. And uh, I said, well, I don't think I want to go. But so the Navy recruiters came to uh, Shilako and then I uh, signed up with the Navy and I told them, uh, well, let's keep me out from going to Fort Leonard, Missouri. He said, sure will. He said, we'll have you on active duty. and. You won't have to worry about the Army anymore. So from when I joined on the 28th of May, 1960, uh, I made it a 20-year career, and I'm a career uh, Navy person. So it was a, you set on it early and it was a good fit. Yes, uh, yeah, it sure was. Got it. Um, well, I want to back up just a little bit. Okay. Um, and so you, you were in Wawoka until the eighth grade until you decided to go to Shilako. Yes. Um, 
was there was there a reason that you went to Sulaco at that point? I think it was more or less the uh, environment at that time. Uh, the uh, the status of the family. We didn't have a lot of money, and you know it cost money back then to. Uh, and I think it was just a benefit for, uh, on my part, for them to send me away to school. My mother had went to Shilako and graduated. My, I had a couple of aunts that went to Shilako and graduated. So it was just kind of a, like a, uh, I don't know if it's a tradition, you would call it a tradition, but people went to Shilako to learn, to train, and to work with each other, and 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 that was where they sent me, you know, they went, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly how it, how it, how it uh, ended up, but, you know, we went down to the post office, there, had, there they had a uh, social worker mm -hmm. that, uh, that they applied my name to go to a school at Chilaco, and I got approved, and that's how I, that's how I ended up going up there, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and I remember going, coming up to Schlocko on a bus. And they dropped me off at the highway and I had a suitcase and me, and they say, that's the way to the school building. And it was a long, long, I always, all I seen was a bunch of trees and a blacktop coming down this way. And they dropped me off and, uh, and from then on, Schlocko became my own. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first day? I do. Uh, the first, actually, the first day, as when the, when they dropped me off, when the bus dropped me off, and I had my suitcase, I was walking down the blacktop, coming this way, and I was, and you couldn't see anything. It was in August, uh, and I had no expectation. I didn't know what was going to happen, you know. And it was a school, and I was going to school. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was maybe halfway down, maybe a quarter way down. A pickup truck came behind me, and I think it was uh, Mr. Cogblazer. He was uh, a boys' advisor at home sick at that summertime, and he said, "Do you need a ride?" He said, "Get in." And he said, "I'm taking you down to school." So he took me down to home six, where the sat in the summertime, they. Uh, the boys that stayed through the summer, they put them in different, in, in one home so they could uh, keep track of them. And so he took me to home six, even though that was a senior and junior home, home six was, and home two was a freshman home. Uh, it was still summertime, so they put me in home six. And I remember I'm calling out a couple of boys that came in, came in and got me. And I'm of the Creek tribe, and they was of the Creek tribe, so they put us all together in one one room. Or mm -hmm. uh, I, I was bunking with those two guys from the Creek tribe. Mm -hmm. So if we spoke each other. We, we you know we know the language, so we under we can, so if we speak, we can they will we'll be able to do that. But if they had put with me with another tribe, I don't know if we could. Uh, communicated, I, you know, I hate to say that because we all speak English, you know, but, but there are just some factors that Creeks maybe do that maybe a Choctaw person or a Chickasha or a Cherokee person don't do, or maybe another uh, uh, Native American, he doesn't do quite as well. We just kind of bond together if we know we're of these particular tribes. Mm -hmm. so, that was my first day. They put me with a, uh, uh, some Creek boys, and that's where that's what my first day I started. And you know, for probably for a couple of weeks until uh, people started coming on the campus. Then they then they moved me to home too, which was a pre freshman uh, mm -hmm. building. Um, well, since it sounds like they were really deliberate, you as a new student to put you in with other boys who were. You know, also Creek. 
Mm -hmm. It sounds like they did that on purpose. And they was already here, and you know maybe they was working uh, through for, for summer here. There's summer. Uh, because and they was older. They was uh, you know they were they weren't uh, freshmen. They was maybe juniors or seniors at mm -hmm. that time, and they put me with them. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. So when they moved you to home too, who were your roommates? Do you remember? I don't remember. It was a big dorm. Uh, there was maybe. Uh, it was bunk beds, so and maybe there was eight people in this one dorm, uh, in one room. There was probably eight of us, uh, you know, stacked in there, you know. And I don't, I could not tell you. I don't even remember who all it was at that time. Understandably, I should have asked the size of the room first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a, right. Um, did they make an effort at that point to try and keep you with other Creek boys at that point, or was it more broadened? Not that I remember. I think we was just kind of all put together, and we just learned to live with each other from then on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> was that your first experience in sort of group group living? Yes, it was. Uh, you know, I grew up as a single child, so uh, at home it was just me, and then and, and my my parents, and uh, the only time we really had any uh, interaction with, with other people was since my dad was a Methodist preacher, uh, when we go to church on Sundays, we usually went to, and he was a circuit preacher, so uh, he preached at four different churches and four different Sundays because we rotated churches that he preached at. Mm -hmm. So every time we went to a church and went to camp there, I knew everybody, you know, mm -hmm. since uh, I knew all the kids we played with and we went to Sunday school together, we played down in the creek with, and and I knew, you know, the majority of the people. But uh, And so my interaction with, uh, uh, a group of people, it was usually there on the, the Sundays or Saturdays or Sundays. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, in actuality, uh, I was, I didn't learn English at an early age. Uh, I tell other people, uh, I really didn't learn, learn ling English until I went into the first grade. When I went into the first grade and we woke up uh, Oklahoma grade school, uh, we was all put, we was in the first grade in this one room and there was probably, I, I say five to eight Indian boys and girls in the same class. They put us in back in a corner because we did not know English and then that's way they started teaching us English uh, separate from the, the white kids when I, when I was in the first grade. Do you remember how you felt about that? Uh, Very sort of I mean, it, 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 it didn't even have an effect on me. We, as long as I was with these guys, boys and girls of the same, we was of the same, you know, and we woke, it's all creek. So we was all just learning whatever we learned, whatever they taught us, what they taught us. That there was no uh, uh, differential uh, being separated from other kids because we was there to learn and you know that's what uh, our parents told us and we just come and being mindful of it and that's what we did yeah you know? i was just thinking that you know i can't i can vaguely remember being a first what well, kind of like what it's like being a first grader but mm -hmm. i can't imagine starting starting something as new at school and not really understanding you know what other what the teachers are telling me that's yeah. really more where i'm coming from that just yeah and I, I tend to think I must have had some learning of English, but, but I don't recall that. You know, I always just, you know, every place we went uh, to these, you know, of course, as I mentioned, my dad was a, was a, was a uh, Creek minister and he, and he spoke, that's the way, when we went to church, they talked in Creek. Mm -hmm. And they preached in Creek. When you went to the campgrounds to eat at lunch, we, we was inundated by Creek. I don't remember English being spoken in all that, in that. And, but it, it had, I'm sure we had, but I just don't recall it. I always think I was just Creek all the way up to the first grade. <laughs>
Um, I, I see what you're saying. That's yeah. probably. Do you still have much chance to speak Creek? Do you get to use that language very often? I don't get to use it very much. Uh, I listen to a lot of tapes. I have a lot of tapes of uh, Creek singing, singing, and uh, and I have songbooks. I got a Bible. You know, but I don't know how to read it though. You know, mm. uh, I can I can sing in Creek, and I can speak Broken Creek. You know, if somebody asked me something in Creek, it would probably be Broken English and Broken Creek. If I answer them back, if I can even recall it. But uh, that's probably a sad part on mine. You know, when you leave, when you leave the environment of the of the Native American places that you've been, you lose you lose that part of you. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that you know when you come back to the Oklahoma area and you go back to the Creek people and they're speaking Creek. It's very difficult to know the uh, complete sentence when they speak it. You pick up certain parts of the language. You say, "Oh yeah, I got a, I got an idea what he's talking about." Mm -hmm. Before it didn't. I mean, they talked to you. You just knew. Now you have to kind of guess as to what they're saying. A funny thing happened many years ago when my uncle was still alive. Uh, we had been away. Being in the Navy, we'd come back home and visit the Indian church where my uncle was at. And he, and he told me, he said, you come here, I don't want nobody speaking English to you. They're all going to speak Creek to you. And while you're here, you speak Creek. And that really kind of sent me back. I said, Carly, I don't even know if I know that. But... While we was there at church and while we was eating there, you know, everybody was speaking Creek and they spoke to me in Creek. <laughs> and, I, and I had to think that probably I didn't speak as much as I usually do because I shut down because I didn't know the language to speak back to them. And my wife was with me and she always remembered that because, uh, you know, to tell somebody you speak Creek while you're here is really, uh, and I really thought he meant it. Maybe he didn't really mean it, but in a way it seemed like he meant it to me when I was there, you know, but we got through the day and it was okay. Mm -hmm. When you went back, to, did you have the same experience or was it just that once? Uh, that's the only time that I really remember. Uh, now, nowadays, you go to a Indian church or a Creek type church. It's more English than anything. You don't hear the, you don't hear the uh, language being spoken in preaching. Usually, on in, and then in singing, they sing both in English and Creek. So there's no, uh, before it was just, when you went to a church, it was all, that's the way it was, you know. Yeah. Well, um, so we're going back to Shalaka. When you, when you were there, I know you, you did mechanics, right? That's yes. what you said. So um, what were some of the other, do you remember any other, other sort of classroom environments or teachers that stand out or anything like that? Favorite subjects, those sorts of things. Uh, well, literature always. Uh, I like literature, and uh, to study literature, I, and I don't know what years it was that was in literature. When they ask us to read instead of listening to lectures. Mm -hmm. I think those types of uh, doing that, making us read out loud to uh, a, a poem or a, uh, a play or something like this, and putting emphasis on in reading the action verbs and, uh, and instead of monotone, and, but I thought literature really 
emphasize that to me. Now. So I really did, did like literature, and uh, and I always been good at math and physics and you know, things like that. So you know, I didn't have any problem with that. But English seemed like English. I didn't do very well in English. I don't know why I didn't do very, why would we not do very good in English? I didn't, but I like literature and I excel in literature because I was able to, uh, I guess, you know, you can read and, and, and produce that. But as far as uh, knowing nouns, verbs, adjectives, and, and adverbs and all that stuff, and uh, in the lower levels, it was fine, but as you got higher, it seemed like it got harder. Yeah, I understand. So was, um, well, I'm going to try not to make any inferences. What, when the auto mechanics part, what made you choose that as your trade? There was a time that probably I was not thinking military. Uh, I always liked automobiles, and I thought I could repair them probably just as good as anybody, you know, uh, we changed tires and, you know, the things that auto mechanics did, I liked doing, working with my hands and repairing engines and automobiles, so I think that's what led me that way. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of other opportunities, we could have went into painting, could have went into dry cleaning, could have went into agriculture, and, uh, a lot of different ways to go, but I selected auto mechanics, and that's where I, I, I learned that trade at Chilocco. Mm -hmm. Did that come in handy at, at points in your life? I think it. Hard to I tell. really didn't. Uh, I really didn't pursue any kind of work in auto mechanics after I joined the Navy. Uh, you know that just you know whenever the environment come home, that was just to take care of the car. We took care of the car because. Uh, if it needs oil change, if it needs new tires, you was aware of those things because uh, being in auto mechanics and at Shilako, those kind, those kind of things of maintenance stuck with you, and I mm -hmm. think that was the health point of that, mm -hmm. going to auto mechanics at Shilako. Yeah. Well, and you also you said that once you went to once you went to Shilako, Shilako was your home from then yes. on. Um, so when you look back on your time there, how do you how do you feel about it? I mean, you're here at the reunion, so that means there's some court, there's still that lingering connection, but yeah, there is. Uh, the first year of Chilocco, of course, was my freshman year, and uh, and we went through the freshman year, and I had the opportunity to stay at Chilocco through the summer. By having a, having a summer job at Chilocco. And I, and I stayed there for two summers, my freshman, uh, end of the freshman year and the end of my sophomore year. Uh, they, hired, they hired some boys to cut grass on the campus for the summer, and it came from auto mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got hired to. Uh, and me and another boy got hired to cut the grass, Chilocco campus grass, uh, through the summer. And, and that was a way to make a little bit of money also to put in, and they put that money in the bank for you mm -hmm. to use during the school year. So, uh, uh, so for the first two years, I didn't, I didn't return back home. I stayed here at Chilocco. So, you know, really, uh, two complete years of not going home, I didn't feel, I guess I didn't feel a miss because, you know, I, I had a home here. I was here at home in Chilocco. And uh, so that really helped me to be able to, uh, you can subsist, be independent on your own without having to rely on people. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, uh, because we still interacted uh, with other students here during the summertime, in the evenings just as well, mm -hmm. they had uh, they had uh, dances for us. And of course, the meals were were always provided for us. Of course, uh, as anything else, our campus life at in the rooms we had, uh, we still had to clean and take care of uh, the 
building still had to be clean and take care of. And I was just talking to a lady the other day, you know, I said, do you remember every Saturday they put out a list of where you were supposed to take care of, are you supposed to work in the bathroom? Are you supposed to work in the hallway, shine in the hall, or working down in the lobby, take care of that? They said, and these gals from that was home five, they said they did that every Saturday, you know. So we had a job to do, even on the weekends. We just, I don't even know if we had any time off. I don't, I don't remember uh, other than in the evenings, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and we can, we can sort of intersperse things that may come up back against Jalaco as we move forward with your military experience. What if, you know, if things sort of trigger, but, um, I wanted to move a little bit to, towards when you enlisted in the National Guard. You talked about going down to Fort Hood, which I understand, but how was it, how was it to be on campus here as a student, but also be enlisted as a National Guard, which was stationed here? I don't think there was any difference. No? I don't think, I don't think they, uh, if, if people looked up to you because he was in the National Guards, I didn't feel that or see that anywhere. And I really didn't know that as I went from my freshman year, junior year to my senior year, other than, other than uh, uh, if it was, if it was a, if it was getting paid for, I think that was a, that was another good thing. You attend these meetings, you have a, a weekend a month that you go Saturday and Sunday, you uh, train and uh, they pay you for that. Mm -hmm. Because being at Shalako, almost I would say the biggest part of the people there, we, we didn't have, we didn't have anything. We didn't have uh, uh, monies coming in to us to be able to spend like we wanted to. Uh, a lot of people shared. Uh, when they got a letter that came in and they probably had lucky to have five dollars and he'd grab all of his friends. We'd go to the canteen, we'd drink Coca-Cola and, and peanuts and, 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 and so it was a sharing experience, and so you don't see one person doing that. He'd get his friends that would all be able to go and share mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I and I can very well remember it. I did, you know, maybe I was lucky to get two letters from home a year, you know, from mm -hmm. from my parents because you know they weren't they weren't uh, fluent or could write the, in in English language very good. So maybe it was just a little note, you know, and maybe it had a couple of dollars in it or something, you know. And, and when you got that, you know, that was a thrill, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe it was a birthday they remembered or maybe it was a Christmas time, I, you know, but, you know, the communications back home in my life, we didn't, it was very sparse. But my home at Shalako, I was with people and I was able to uh, interact with a lot of people. So I guess, you know, that's why it became a home to me. Mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. Did your parents come visit at no, all? Not no. once, yeah. Mm, no. Which I don't think is unusual. I was yeah. just curious. No, they never did. Yeah. So when you, um, when you graduated in 1960 and you got to join the Navy and fulfill your your childhood mission to yes. put on the white suit, right? Um, so you you were immediately shipped to California, is that yes, right? Yes, uh, uh, since I, we graduated on the 27th, the next day uh, I reported to the uh, physical place in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. Passed the physical because I had already taken the test and they, they, they was just wanted me to report down there on the 28th. Uh, I reported on 28th that evening, that night, they put, on some, they put us on a plane to San Diego, California. Oh gosh, so physical to double check and then just shipped you off? Yeah. 
Um, so what did you think when you made it to California? Do you well, remember that at all? Well, uh, I remember us, uh, you know, getting off the plane and they loaded us on the bus because there was a number of us being shipped out of the Navy office up there because that's where it was at. Mm -hmm. When we landed, they put us on the bus and took us out to the training center in San Diego. When we got off the bus, there was a whole bunch of squares out there and they said, find a square to stand in with your bag or baggage, whatever you had. And so as we were standing there on the baggage stuff and then, uh, then I think it began. I think, you know, you, you, the hollering and the screaming and the stand tall and you know the military training to begin that at time on the squares you know and then from then on it was like a 12 week uh, time there in, in uh, San Diego yeah. but it wasn't hard because I had come from an environment of living with people mm -hmm. and being under cleaning and uh, we had duties to do. So when you was instructed by uh, the Navy instructors or whoever had you and told you to do something, it, we just did it. Mm -hmm. Some people had a hard time. Uh, if. Uh, Given, I mean, when they uh, authority tells you to do something, some people do not adapt it this well. I think we adapted well. Uh, of course, that, you know, I don't know how many people came with us when we flew to San Diego, or how many people from Oklahoma was in the same company that I was in. I think we just kind of, you know, everybody just kind of went, and they just kind of. Mm -hmm. put you in different places, but I didn't find it difficult at all going through military because I felt like when I look back on it, the training and the environment that we lived in with a groups of people here in Chilocco as well as uh, having uh, cleaning and, and, and an authority figure above you at all time, it was, it was a breeze. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any problems at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, you were in boot camp, and at that point, you were in boot camp. Then. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so, what happened after you left boot camp then? Uh, just before we left boot camp, I got orders, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Or, I was just a seaman. Seaman recruit. I didn't have any job skills or anything, uh, and I, I don't remember even them talking to me about going to a school or anything. I was just a seaman recruit. Anyway, I got orders to uh, uh, USS Maury AGS-16, and I, I really didn't know what that was, other than it was in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, come to find out, it was a geographical survey ship. And then, uh, so after boot camp, went home on two weeks leave, and then I had to report back to, I don't remember where we reported back to, uh, to fly over to Hawaii. But uh, everybody that I knew and spoke with knew that I was in the Navy. And where was you going over and say, oh, I'm going to Hawaii. Oh, wow, that's a nice place, but a long ways, you know. Hawaii was, when you spoke Hawaii, their visions was palm trees and beaches and soothing music and, you know, it wasn't a military environment. It was what we all think Hawaii is when we think of Hawaii. And that's the way people thought. And maybe to some extent, maybe that's what I thought because I had never been on a ship other than on a training thing. But when we got, uh, when we flew into Hawaii and then they, uh, there again, we, you know, we rode a bus and went to Pearl Harbor and then we checked on board uh, uh, 
the ship and then they then assigned us to wherever we they wanted us to be and then that's where we went. my time started there on the Mari. What was your job? My job, well, I was in second division. Second division was a, there was a deck division, which took care of the middle half of the ship. They had the first division took care of the front part, second division the middle part, third division took care of the aft part of the ship. Is uh, sweeping, mm -hmm. painting, chip paint, red lead, keep it clean, basically, and. And we had a cargo hold. We took, uh, you know, as as you became more knowledgeable and doing things, you was able to, you know, run the rigs, taking the cargo in and out. But as a as a young recruit, you was probably down in a hole, moving boxes to put them in nets, and then they'd haul them up. And so it was just a general. Uh, general uh, job that we, everybody did that didn't have a mm -hmm. regular job to do. We did everything. Mm -hmm. How long were you on that ship then? I was on that ship for three years. Uh, and I advanced in rank really pretty, pretty easily. And I always liked guns. And uh, so, you know, after a couple of years, I, you know, you watch people. He said, well, what would I like to do in the Navy? I uh, said, I think I'd like to be a gunner's mate. Mm -hmm. So I checked, and I kept checking. I took out courses, fill out my courses, and, uh, and got approval to take a test. And I was still in the deck division. I wasn't in the gun division. I was still in the deck division. But they gave me approval to take the Gunners made third class tests since I had advanced to seaman uh, E2 and advanced E3, and you take a test to go to E4. So I got approval as an E3 to take the E4 Gunners made exam, even though I was still, a, I didn't have no experience. Mm -hmm. And I passed the test, so they transferred me to the gun division. Mm -hmm. uh, on board the Mari, uh, the guns were mostly small arms since it wasn't a combatant ship. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, mostly small arms and, you know, kind of luckily I fell into it because the guy, the, the third class that was down there, we had a second or first class that was in charge of that gunnery department mm -hmm. along with the officer. That young third class was getting out of the Navy, so he left. And I just kind of moved right in, you know, so that's where I uh, started my career as a gunner's mate. Let's see. Um. So is that what you spent most of your career in the military? Or? I did. Uh, most of it was. Uh, when I left there, then uh, I, I had... Uh, advanced to second class on while on board because there was just a waiting time of one year before you can advance. Mm -hmm. Well just before my three and a half years was up, I got advanced to second class. And I made a decision that I was gonna make it a career. Mm -hmm. So uh, I advanced to second class and re and signed up for six more years. I got $2,000 bonus <laughs> and got a transfer. I got transferred to a, a brand new ship in San Diego, California. They was putting it in commission. They had built the ship and they was selecting the crews for it. And I was one of the pre-commission and crew for the, it was a compact, combat uh, uh, store ships. AFS stands for uh, food. I mean, it was a floating supermarket, mm -hmm. and it had frozen food, fresh vegetables, anything, anybody. It would resupply other ships that stayed at sea. Right. And once they we unloaded all our stuff, mm -hmm. we'd come back into port and reload it back up, 
and then we'd go back and resupply them again. Uh, but I was in a gun division, so there we had some guns on board, and I learned, I learned uh, to operate those and, you know, become gun captains and, you know, just whatever we had to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, on there, I advanced to first class, and uh, I took over the division, but I had a chief above me, and then, of course, you have officers above you there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been at sea for probably, uh, you know, normally you spend about five years at sea, then you get to shore duty a little bit. Well, this particular ship uh, was in San Diego. We got home ported in Yokosuka, Japan. So I went over to Japan for three years, three and a half years over there in Yokosuka, Japan. It was just, so we just stayed over there. Uh, it was during the Vietnam War that uh, I was on board and then we'd come back down to the, to the Gulf of uh, Vietnam and we'd resupply all the carrier groups, destroyer groups, uh, any ships that were out there, and we'd leave uh, out of Yokosuka, Japan, and come down for, say, four months doing that, in and out of Subic Bay, Philippines, resupply our ship in Subic Bay, Philippines, go back out on the line, fill, fill them up, mm -hmm. and make port visits to Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and then, you know, so, We'd do four months doing that, and then we'd go back up to Yokosuka, Japan, and maybe have upkeep to do any repairs that we needed for six, maybe eight months. Then mm -hmm. we'd come back down and do the same thing over and over. So I, I spent, you know, three and a half years doing that in Japan. And they said, Gunner, you got too much time at sea. You need to go with the shore duty. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll go to shore duty, I guess, you know. So uh, I put in to be a recruiter, mm -hmm. Navy recruiter. Mm -hmm. So in 1969, I got, I got orders to uh, a recruiting school in, in Dallas, Texas. And I went to recruiting school. I went, well, I guess the school was in San Diego for like six weeks and then went to Dallas to get orientated and they moved me to Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, which was my hometown. Did you request that? Yes, uh, okay. I read, and they said I went to a, a recruiting station in Oklahoma City, and I was there for three years. Mm -hmm. And there in that three years, that's where I met my wife. <laughs> uh, let's see, we got married, and then uh, she come from a family of eight, and I was just sick, <laughs> so. It was a it was a big change mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun. Uh, my transition, so got ready to leave recruiting duty because it was only three years. But she was only you know had been married with me for about a year and a half, and and she didn't know anything about Navy life, you know. And so we started. Uh, I got orders to uh, electronic school in Great Lakes, Illinois. And so I was in electronic school for a year in Great Lakes, Illinois, and and I had left Oklahoma City, and she came up later, about three, four months later. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she learned that she had to get the household packed, <laughs> and the packers come in, move you out, and then her and another lady drew, drove up to Great Lakes, Illinois, and we had a place up there that uh, we stayed in for a year mm -hmm. before I got we got orders to uh, Guam from there. I so when to, did you go to Guam? Had to be in seventy uh, one or seventy two. Because I was on gunboats then. I would have seven gunboats in Guam. Mm -hmm. And we always travel in pairs. Mm -hmm. So we went, the, the gunboats, I, the gunboat that I was assigned to was already over in Vietnam, but I was in Guam. They flew me to Guam, got her settled in, 
and they said, well, uh, Gunner, you're going to have to go to Guam. They don't have any Gunner's mates on board, and they need you over there. I said, okay. I said, I'm ready to go. So I was had my family settled, so uh, we went to Anderson Air Force Base, which is the northern part of Guam, and uh, they met me there and says, Gunner, uh, we're going to have to take you. I said, okay. So, they, since I had a secret clearance, they handcuffed me and gave me a bag. Oh, really? <laughs> and I had to wave through the window to my wife <laughs> and tell her, I said, I have to write you a letter. I said, I'm, I'm already, they got me. And so, uh, they flew me and they flew me out. And when I went, we flew into Saigon. And of course, I was met by, uh, people that were authorized to release my bags from me because I was carrying secret documents with me. And, and uh, so I had to write to my wife. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't uh, say goodbye because, you know, I didn't realize that they was going to do that to me. So when I checked in, they just took me and I, so I didn't have chance to say goodbye. <laughs> so why, well, there's a lot of why. <laughs> so what, why did it need to be you and, and what, what was the point you were just transferring intel? Is that what was going on? Yeah, yeah. And people were just transporting you because you had the clearance? I had clearance and uh, so I was selected. I don't know how I was selected. Uh, I they see. knew when, by my orders that uh, when I checked in by on my orders it and they got a lot of codes on there. And they know that uh, they said, here's a first class gunner's mate, got his top secret clearance. And they mm -hmm. said, Gunner, come with me. So I went with him and that's when they, they said, okay, here you are. And here's what you, you need to do to be able to be relieved of your thing. I said, okay. You know, and it was just, you just know those things, I guess, being in the military. For, yeah these years, so when I got to Saigon, I was met by these people and they took the, took that away from me and then they transferred me down to uh, a SEAL base to catch my ship. And I stayed overnight at the SEAL base and then the next day they transferred me to the little, little port where the gunboats came in and out of and then that's where I'm, I was uh, put on board. And we didn't have a gun, a gunner's mate on board. We only have one gunner's mate on board that ship. And uh, they said, Gunner, we lost our gunner uh, a couple of months ago, and we've been without a gunner, and we need you to get these guns ready to shoot. I said, no problem, I'll take care of it. <laughs> so uh, I worked, uh, I don't know, you know, you know, you know to get them ready. Mm -hmm make sure they was ready and we had three inch, uh, three inch 50 gun forward I had a 40 millimeter half and I had twin 50s on each side that was our armament on that gunboat mm -hmm. so in uh, you know two two three weeks time I said captain I said we're ready he said let's go try them out so we was out at sea he said okay let's Let's go to go to uh, go to general quarters, mm -hmm. which is general quarters. Everybody goes to battle stations. So we went to battle station. I went to the front gun up there, and and during this period of time, we've been having training sessions with people in, in gun mount as to what they need to do, how they need to operate, and then we had dummy loads that we've been practicing with. So. Uh, there was an island out there, un, uninhibited island. It was just a rock, piece of like a piece of rock stuck out there. And they said, "Okay, let's uh, let's give it a shot." You know, so you know we we did it manually through the gun, and we fired shots. You know, in there, and then of course we had a control that we relinquish control to them up there and they could control us. And, mm -hmm. and uh, 
that went fire. So then we went back and to the back. Cumin double 40, and we just fired rounds and just fired and fired until we just ran out mm -hmm. as much as we needed. Then, of course, they wanted to see how the 2050s run. So I had uh, people who knew how to operate those things. And I said, okay, they're ready to go. And they had a box of <laughs> ammunition. And what they did was, uh, was put a balloon out there in the water, mm -hmm. well, a weather balloon. They blow the weather balloon and stuck it out there, oh, you know, maybe 200 yards or 300 yards, I don't know what to And they'd fire at that thing. And, of course, very difficult for a, a balloon to get punctured unless you hit it just right. You know, it just all around it, you know, and mm -hmm. they turned the ship and the other side would just fire and fire at it. So, uh, it was, the ship was then combat ready. Mm -hmm. They considered it combat, because it wasn't combat ready when I come on board until after we had repair the guns and after we had fired the guns and and uh, made sure that we was ready for combat, that we became combat ready. Right. Our job uh, in Vietnam was to uh, stop Saipan traffic along the coast. We carried a Vietnamese officer with us, and he had intel that knew when they was transporting ships or boats were transporting ammunition, guns, people from north to south. And our job was to inspect them, uh, call people to come and get them, lock them up, or whatever they do to them. So, uh, uh, and we did a lot of this at night. Daytime, there's, there's nobody out there on water because they can see people. They always did it at nighttime. So, mm -hmm. our job at night was to have our guns manned. And the Vietnamese officer would get this intel. He said, okay, let's stop this one up here. And so, our ship would maneuver and tell that Saipan or something to stop. And then we'd, we'd go on board, inspect mm -hmm. the Saipan with arm, side arms on board. And, uh, and then he would clear it or either we would confiscate and then they would send smaller boats out to take contraband and take it back into port. And then we'd go back on patrol again. Our patrol time was like three months at a time along the coast. And then we would go back to go back to Guam and we'd get relieved by two other boats that did that three months at a time. Mm -hmm. And we'd go back in port for a little upkeep, painting, rest of crew or switch some crew members around. So I was in Guam for two years. We was in Guam for two years. And then uh, I got uh, transferred. Oh, well, I had to go back. The war ended while we was over there in 1983. Yeah, 73. 73. 73, the war ended. So they said, okay, we don't need the boats over there anymore. Send them back stateside. So all seven of us, we sent our families back. They lo loaded up their uh, airplanes and they, they flew them all back. And they said, well, we'll be back in about two months. And so we, flew, we, we started our trek back. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had to be refueled every, uh, you know, at least once a week because you didn't care not that much fuel to be able to go long distances, long distances. Plus we had to be food refill for our crews. We had crews of 20 on board. So that was, that was our people. And, uh, so, uh, 
we transit back, finally made it to Hawaii, and then we from Hawaii, we made it to San Diego. And then the boat that I was on, we was going, it was going to Great Lakes, Illinois. That's where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made it through the Panama Canal, went through Fort Lauderdale and into and, and Norfolk, Virginia. I got off in Norfolk, Virginia. My time was up then. And I went back to recruiting duty. Uh -huh. So I went to recruiting in Lawton, Oklahoma for uh -huh. two years. I see. So that's where my family had moved. They knew I was going to Lawton, Oklahoma. So my wife <laughs> and kids, they all, <laughs> that's, they had got a house and they, you know, she had did that. That's, uh, that's the Navy wife, you know, <laughs> but, uh, she got that done. And then, uh, after two years, uh, of recruiting, they said, we need, uh, we need you again. Of course, they always need you, right? <laughs> Uh, getting off recruiting, or you're getting off recruiting, or your time is almost up. They're going to send you to the USS John Paul Jones, guided missile destroyer out of San Diego, California. So, there again, we loaded up and the family moved to San Diego, California. But the ship was in. Lost Long Beach, California, getting worked on. That's where it was getting overhauled. But it was actually stationed in San Diego, so we bought a home in San Diego. I had to go to Long Beach, California for, uh, I'd stay up there like two weeks and I'd come back home for a weekend and go back up for two weeks for, oh, maybe six months. And then finally the ship went out on uh, trial runs, got all its certifications, then we finally made it back to San Diego, California. <laughs> and then from there, that's where I retired in 1979 off the USS John Paul Jones. Um, so what was your decision in retiring then? What, what was sort of prompted you? When you're in the military, well, I knew I was going to make it a career and 20 years and there's even today some people have spent 28 years and some people spend more that more than that in there. When you get to the break of say 13 to 14 years, uh, I'll go back a little bit further. My first enlistment after three and a half years, I thought I would get out and be a highway patrolman. I wrote Department of uh, Oklahoma, Department of Oklahoma Highway Patrol, and asked for an application or to get what what are the qualifications to become a highway patrolman. I got a letter back from had to be twenty five years old. I was nowhere close. I wasn't even 21 years old yet. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my decisions. I said, well, I might as well just stay in the Navy. So I stayed in the Navy and didn't become a highway patrol. So as you get into the 13th and 14th year, six, seven years is a long time away. It seems like it was because you're in a situation where, you know, it's just hard. It just the Navy is just. Oh, I don't like this captain here. I mean, he just. I don't like my lieutenant. He's just driving me crazy. And and you say, well, my time is getting close. But the long run, after twenty years, you start getting retired pay. After twenty, you get full medical benefits, which after. 20 years. Those overrode the uh, hardships in the 13th and 14th year, mainly for retirement, 
getting paid, medical, family is taken care of, mm -hmm. and we can do really what we want after that, you know. So that that's what kept me in until 1979 to be able to retire. I had a year of National Guard time, which gave me some longevity time, and which got me over the 20 year mark easy enough to retire at 20 years with full pay or half, usually it's 50% 50 pay is what they mm -hmm. pay you at that time. So uh, from San Diego, we said that's what we want to do. But the decision come up prior to retiring is what we're going to do after 20. Mm -hmm. We had a camper two years, probably two years prior to uh, retiring. And we came back to Texas. We didn't want to come back to Oklahoma. We wanted to come to Texas. It's farther enough away from family that they were not in the gossiping family ties that we've seen. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be away from family. So I wrote to 15 Chamber of Commerce is in East Texas. And got information back from them. Why would I want to live in this particular town? Mm -hmm. And we was looking at maybe 20, 25,000. We've been in big cities and said, oh, we just want to go back and just take it easy for the rest of our life. It wasn't that easy. When we came back, when so we visited it. We visited Nashadosha. We visited uh, uh, off 20 up there close to uh, Shreveport and you know, all those little long view and places up and down that road. And uh, there was, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't anything for me to, to get a job at. Mm -hmm. Job, job. It, it just, everything was just slow, and it, you know, we so, so used to fast moving and stuff. So, uh, so we really didn't make a decision to come out to West Texas. So when we re I retired, we just took a month off. We went to Yellowstone, we went to the Black Hills, and we just traveled to Colorado and may have finally made our way back and uh, stopped at her mother and dad's house in Enid, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And we decided, well, let's drive over there. We went over there to West Texas <clears throat> and stopped, uh, I can't think of the name of the town now. But well, we stopped there and camped at their camp at the campground at the lake. And I said, "Let's go into town and let's get some pizza." You know, I had two boys. You know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, Dad, that's great. Let's go. So we went to town. I don't know if it was a Pizza Hut or what it was. We walked in and ordered pizza. I said, "Well, I said, well, I have a pitcher of beer." Oh no, we don't sell beer. Dry County. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, you got to go to Crockett, Texas to get beer. I said, okay. Uh, that kind of wasn't a big deal, but it, you know, it's another check mark that you don't check good at. So, so we went back to the campground, 4th of July. Fireworks, they were going to have fireworks after the, after the lake and all that. And, and they had fireworks at the lake that evening. People had been drinking, and carrying on. Somebody pulled a gun. Somebody, cousin shot a cousin, just right in this pavilion, right across from us. Cops came out and hauled them all off. Ambulance came out and hauled them off. And I had my family inside our tent. If they had shot through that metal, it would have went right through there. It wouldn't have stopped them, but you know, that's where we were at. Next day, the guy came out, one of the guys came out and apologized for 
shooting and all that kind of stuff. And so we loaded up, came to Austin, Texas. In 1979, we came to Austin, Texas and uh, went to KOA and uh, we said, that's where we're gonna stay. And so that's where we stayed. And I went back to school and got my business degree and, mm -hmm. and went to work for, funny thing is, I went to work at Cliff Creek Chevrolet as a, as a, a bookkeeper doing warranty work, balancing warranties for the month, 10 key. He said, here's your debts, here's your 10 key, and, and we need to, we balance every 25th day of the month, we start our balance. So, I did that for almost a year, and I said, this is not what, for me. I can't, I can't do this. Nice people to work with, but uh, so, uh, my wife had went to work for Round Rock School District and, uh, in 1981, and this was uh, 1983, I had worked as an electrician, well, let's go, go back. We got a house in North Austin, mm -hmm. and to qualify for it, I had to have a job, mm -hmm. even though I had some money for down payment. Oh no, that's not good, I had to have a job on paper. The realtor gave me a job on paper as a, as a carpet layer for $4 an hour. That's all it took. As long as I had my name or carpet layer for $4 an hour, I got approved for this house, a loan mm -hmm. for this house. So he's the one that helped us get our house there and we lived in it for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. Are you still <laughs> but, there? <laughs> no, I sold that one. <laughs> but then I went and worked for an electric company as a uh, electrician helper because I needed a job while I was going to school. Mm -hmm. So. As an electrician, electrician, electrician helper, uh, you just kind of being it was a dog for the journeyman. You know, we hire, we pull wire, we pull wire through empty new houses, so the boxes that you see in the, in the walls, uh, pull uh, air conditioning and wires, and you know, just getting it. Okay. So I did that for oh maybe a year and a half and. And I, and I said, I really like to work in the office. I said, I can do payroll. You know, I've mm -hmm. got an accounting degree. <laughs> okay, yeah, good deal. So they hired me inside the office to do payroll mm -hmm. for them. And, uh, and so I worked there for almost three years. And then until uh, my wife went to work in 81 at school in 83, she said, they got a job open up here if you want. And it was a man and textbooks, doing textbooks. So I applied mm -hmm. and uh, they hired me. Can you type? Yeah, yeah, I can type over 30 words a minute. I can do 10 key, I know all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So they hired me, you know. And so I worked for Round Rock School for the district 25 years and retired. Oh, really? Yeah. I started out as a secretary in the textbooks doing secretary, you know, giving uh, books to so many school, keeping how many book, textbooks this school had, that school had, that all administrative type work. But in the back room, that person was also audio-visual, taking mm -hmm. care of 16 millimeter projectors, slide projectors, film projectors. And I said, I can do that. I said, I had some electronic training in the Navy. He said, oh, come on back, you know, start putting plugs in the, you know, broken plugs and uh -huh. putting them together, you know, fixing that. Yeah, pretty good, you know, that stuff. So I moved from office, went into technical operations. Yeah. They started coming. Computers came into the district in Round Rock High School and, I, and Round Rock Schoolers in 1983. They had a big IBM box sitting on the secretary's desk. Had about three or five gigabytes of hard drive, big 
big heavy thing. I put one on my wife's desk. I said, here's your computer, and here's your keyboard, and here's your big screen. I mean, it was, it wasn't a big screen then, but it was weighed a ton, you know? Mm -hmm. We also set up from Apple, since Apple was right there in Round Rock, they did Apple, we put up Apple Labs. We started putting Apple Labs in these schools, and we, so, and then, they sent me to laser school and they sent me to printer school and wow. so, you know, I really, and then after so many years, my boss was going to retire and uh, they asked me to take over. That wasn't my intent when I first went to work around for, I wanted a job eight to five, a punch clock, I mm -hmm. leave and I had no worries at all. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that easy as you, <laughs> you know, they see you and they say, ah, that guy, <laughs> yeah, we want him, you know, so he has a pay raise and, you know, you're in charge, you got four guys that you're going to be in charge. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. So and that just kind of led on, led on. I became uh, uh, in charge of, it totally ended up being seven guys over a, when I retired, I had, there was all computer technicians. We had all been qualified by Dell Computers. Mm -hmm. It was all certified uh, warranty people by Dell. We also had two telephone people. Since the district repaired its own computers, mm -hmm. it repaired its own phone system. So it was, we didn't have to call outside people to come in. Right. So uh, that was, Technical operation was my department when I retired with seven people, and after 25 years, I turned it over, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that was six, seven years ago, I retired. <laughs> and that was my career, and that, so that's where I ended up and where I came to today. You have two different, two different careers, two yeah. full careers, yeah. yeah. Um, Gosh, there's a lot to even, I gotta make a decision here. Um, <laughs> what, one of the things, I didn't, I didn't interrupt to ask this, but I'm curious about it because it comes up in other interviews. Okay. When you, when you moved into your military career, um, was, did you have interactions with um, other Native Americans? Did you see other Shilako folks in any part? You know, like, did you ever sort of have that connection back to campus or back to home or with that sort of ethnicity being different than the majority? Being in the Navy, <clears throat> anytime you've seen a, not in my younger art, because, you know, you, you don't have any power in a lower area other than making friends with someone. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can tell a Native American seems like to ride off. You know, you've been around people enough to say, ha ah, ah, he's not Mexican, he's a Native American, because you can almost, for some reason, and if you uh, approach him that way or in, in a way that you finally get it out of who, you know, where you're from, you know, to, you know, to learn those things. And, uh, but I do not, I do not, I have not seen a lot of them. I don't know if Navy is not the place. You see, uh, I've seen a lot of Navy guys in there today that stood up, the during, most I've ever seen. During the breakfast. <laughs> during the breakfast. <laughs> Usually we look around, look at each other, maybe three of us stand up. <laughs> but today there was a bunch of us, I said, golly, that's a lot of Navy guys here today. Wow, that's great. But in the military, the Navy, you don't see that many Navy guys mm -hmm. come through there. Oh, there's been you know, here or there or something. But being in the Navy, I knew they had Shilako reunions way back when we used to have them on campus. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They used to have it in the dining hall. We came back for a couple of them, or you know, the timing was right to for us to come back and go to a Shoaco reunion when they used to have it on campus in the, in the mess hall up there, you know. Mm -hmm. and then we went away for a long period of time until uh, I guess it just kind of you you want to come back you because you you knew a lot of classmates and you you kept your uh, annuals and you kept your you know your books that you people you graduated with and you say oh how many people are going to be up there this year mm -hmm. you know that we get to see you know. There's never always been more than six to ten, sometimes about six people all you see from your class. When we had our 50th year up here, when I came up here, that was, I think maybe that was ten of uh, class of 76. We had 76 people in our class when we graduated. Mm -hmm. And maybe there was ten that our 50th year up here. And I have no idea what happened to the rest of them, but mm -hmm. I always, any time we came back to Oklahoma, I don't think Shalaka was never out of your mind. You always remembered uh, this place up here. Yeah. And you felt, I mean, I've heard that from other people, but it sounds like you, you talk about that as alumni. Mm -hmm. It seems like. Yeah, there's, uh, and we've, we've been to quite, you know, we've came up here quite a bit. I didn't come up last year, but we was up here the year before because, you know, maybe we had a mm -hmm. conflict with another scheduling or something. But right. we we tried to be aware of the season, knowing that it's going to be in May or the first part of June. And mm -hmm. we try to allow to work around that so we can make that effort to come up here, you know. Yeah. Like so many of them, you know, we don't know how many more years we'll be able to come up here, but, uh, you know, whatever we have, uh, we'll continue to, you know, come if we have the opportunity to come up here, we'll do that, mm -hmm. you know. Do you have ways in your life now that you um, sort of nurture your own Native American identity? I mean, Shalako, you get together with a yeah. bunch of folks for that and maybe family, but I don't know. Very difficult. I find it very difficult because I live in Texas yeah. and you don't have, you don't have a group of Indians down there. Or I haven't seen a group of Indians down there uh, since I grew up to me in a in the uh, in a church environment, and then there was this environment over here. We were not allowed to go to stomp dances and powwows and stuff since I was my dad was a Methodist preacher. Mm -hmm. That was like taboo. Stay away from them. It maybe wouldn't mention, but you know, they was they was over here. Why was that? I don't know. Really? And I wonder why, even today, because I feel like I missed, uh, I missed part of it, because I don't understand uh, why they wear certain things. You know, why do they wear the handkerchief on the back of their thing? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, just certain things because I didn't grow up that my my life growing up was over here, so that was because a lot of times the association with stomp dances and power was drinking, mm -hmm. and that was a no go. That was a no for the preacher's kid on this side over here. So stay from that. Yeah. My uncles used to come back from their military service, and they'd go to stomp dances and powwows, and they'd be out all night long, and then they'd show up coming home early in the morning, he'd, uncle would come home, and he'd, dad would be, God, no, he'd know where to start and smell a beer and stuff. I mean, it was just, 
that was uh, that was just that seemed like that's what separate them at that time, you know. And really, uh, as you, as you read history, those were going on, you know, when we was in the Alabama and Georgia, you know, the, when they celebrated, they did dances and they did did things. I'm sure uh, when the when they become uh, Christianized, I don't know if there was any separation at all. I, I, I just don't know, mm -hmm. you know, and I've read books and I've read the internet and I've read the histories of Georgia and Alabama and the separation of the Seminoles and, and all that. And, and, uh, and I'm still curious even today yeah. of powwow dress, powwow dances, powwow songs because it always seems they're Western Indians and not yeah. Eastern Indians. Interesting. I don't know if that uh, if you if you know if you realize because it's Cheyenne, it's Osage, it's Crow, and it's uh, Arapaho. Uh, it's all kind of Western tribes that does uh, most of the dances and most of the singing that goes on Oto and and it's not the Cherokees, it's not the Charlie, it's not the five civilized tribes. It's the other tribes that does that. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. Interesting. But they do have stomp dances over there in eastern Oklahoma. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Well, that's interesting. Um, I think I've kept you for your hour and a half. Okay. Um, is there is there anything else that we didn't talk about or that you didn't get a chance to talk about that you feel important to mention? No, no thank you. We covered uh, my start from <laughs> as a young person, a <laughs> uh, pretty long route, you know, that I've been on and. Uh, and up to my retirement, you know, and, and you know, making my trips here, you know, and other trips that we're, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, and, you know, we're leaving the 25th here in another, like next weekend, Sunday. Yeah. We're going to, we'll be flying to London and we're going to catch uh, the Nor uh, Royal Caribbean ship navigator seas for a 12 day cruise of the Baltics and the Northern capitals up there. All right. Be our 16th cruise. <laughs> <laughs> so I've worked all this in. So I've worked all these in between. You're still vacationing on boats though. Yeah. I mean, you're still. <laughs> yeah, still boats. We're still doing boats. <laughs> yeah. I do. I still do in boat. And where some people say, "Oh, I wouldn't float on one of those no things." Boats. The sea's too deep out there, and they're absolutely correct. <laughs> I'll tell you an instance. We on <clears throat> some of those ships that we've been on, Navy. Mm -hmm. We've stopped in the middle of the ocean and had swim call for the crew. Not me. <laughs> I mean, they'd just oh. uh, they'd just jump off and dive into the water. Of course, we had. I and when I when that's going to happen, they usually call me. Say, hey, Gunner, we're going to stop tomorrow. Would you have? Would you post some sentries? Because mm -hmm. you know sharks and stuff. And I, I say, yeah, no problem. Tell me when y'all going to do it. I'll have them. I'll have them posted. So, the captain would just stop the ship and it just free float. Swim, call for the crew, and they just dump, jump off, dive off, and you know, come back on board. I mean, you know, for an hour or whatever time they would do that. And uh, that water's deep. If you was to go down, you'd never come back up. We would lose them. So I can understand when you say people go overboard and they can't find them. I mean, it's a long way. They go down, it's a long ways down. Mm -hmm. uh, funny instance, though, I'll tell you another story. Uh, being on gunboats and being over in Vietnam, warm water, 
does not evaporate and to make fresh water very much in evaporators because it needs to be a little cooler to evaporate to, to separate salt water from to make fresh water. Mm -hmm. So uh, our trips are where a lot of times, you know, we didn't shower for a, day, a couple of days you know, because we try to keep the water for the of the cooks to do that. But if the captain seen a rain shower or a squall over there, he would cause it. There's a squall over on the port side, all they want to take a shower, get your soap. And so everybody would go down below and then he'd go underneath the squall and we'd just all get naked and just Wash, wash ourselves, and that was our shower. <laughs> and then we'd towel off, and then we'd just go back on patrol again. So, but people would never thought that, and to wash clothes, mm -hmm. and sometimes we'd just tie a rope on our pants and, and shirt and dangle it over the side, and the, the waves would wash it for us and then bring it back on board and you rinse it out in a bucket and hang it on the rails to dry. And that would be, that would be, that would be sometimes our day. Mm -hmm. Showers, however, uh, we take it for granted. We can just go in here, go in there. But sometimes we can't do that in a lot of situations. So those little things yeah. make your day. Those are, <laughs> and those are really, those are really special memories too. Yeah. Because it's not what most people. You wouldn't think. You wouldn't yeah. think that. I mean, it was just us out there. It make no difference. Was, right. We had it. I mean, there was soap was a flowing, you know. <laughs> the rain was washing it off, and we was all clean. We felt good, or washed our hair, and you know, because <laughs> after three, four days, it's not always, you know, no. the best, best place to be. You know, when you get a bunch of sailors together down there, you know. So it was a good time. Those are good, good thoughts. <laughs> I think that's a good memory to end on. I like that. <laughs>